my last session for the semester. This is 307 main campus, 2023-2024 academic year. We are doing our mop-up and then our uh, exam modalities and we'll be out of here. Just want to know if people have any questions they want to seek clarification on or for. If not, then I'll, I'll walk you through what I believe we have covered. This is your course site I'm now sharing. This is field 307 for main campus. This is the course outline. We are well vexed in, I'm sure. You know, the course objectives, the outcomes. We did those during the beginning of the semester. Some in class ass assessment, group presentation, research paper that you were expected to give feedbacks on. The grading skill you are sure of. Please look on your screen. I'm projecting for my special students. You know how we do it. I'm just projecting the course outline, please. Okay. Weekly lecture topics and reading. We know who we're supposed to cover substantively. So, uh, week one. This is an elective. It's uh, field 307. Rationalism, course rationalism. Okay. So, some introduction, some grouping, some course outline, what have you? We did that. Uh, we we got ourselves informed and you know uh, we did some readings on skepticism the three versions and we I, I think i touched on it briefly in class because it was just for research but you may need it to understand the other discussions we've had and to be able to even respond to them why uh, you think of david hume for example as a skeptic what kind of skeptic was he <laughs> because we know that it is his skepticism, for example, his absolute, not absolute, his, his level of skepticism that may can't, see, they can't be part that we, we worked on last. He, he was concerned about the kind of skepticism that Hume's empiricism led us to. So if you don't understand the versions of skepticism, at least, then you won't see what the point was that is made. Hume wasn't an absolute skeptic. So you have to know absolutely skeptics. And it wasn't just the common sense skepticism that we all, philosopher or not, express about knowledge. Are you sure you won the lottery? When I ask you that, I'm expressing common sense skepticism. Are you sure? You're sure, ba. Hey, you know. Do you, are you sure the sugar is okay? I'm, I'm being doubtful about how much sugar you're putting in the tea. And that is the common sense one. Then we have the philosophical skeptic. And so we, we saw all that, which Hume's philosophical skepticism took him to the extreme level of raising doubt, raising skepticism about even substance and causality, the principles that are often taken for granted. Now you can relate to that because we've done our Kant. <clears throat> Excuse me, and you see what Kant was dealing with over there. So that was one of the things we wanted to deal with. Then we saw knowledge. If if we can know something, in other words, if absolute skepticism is not defensible because it is self-refuting and self-contradictory, then it means we can know something. Then what then is knowledge? How do we know and what are the sources of justifying those claims of knowledge we make? That led us to rationalism and empiricism. I'm just projecting your course out and summing up to do a quick mop up that. So we saw the rationalist and the empiricist approach to epistemology. And just to help us clarify the notion of rationalism, which is a course proper, we, we, we engaged the Majid paper that dealt with the supposed uh, disconnect between what is considered rational and the supernatural or things that go beyond the natural. The thinking that things that have to do with the supernatural are not necessarily within the scope of rationality. We we saw that Majid's contribution to that discourse and how he intertwines that with humanism, all looking at an African perspective, and he critiquing what he felt was an internal inconsistency in Western thought. Okay. Why did we bring that in? Because we want to see the varied ways of using the term rationality or rationalism. So we can have the loose sense of the word to be rational, which is not necessarily talking the technicality of rationality as an epistemological concept. Okay, so we can say be rational about this decision. 
it means apply some thought to it, so to speak. It doesn't necessarily, uh, you know, re require being opposed to the empiricist. So we can use the word rational to mean in the generic sense, the general use of the word, which is not necessarily the technical use of the word rational. Rationality as the opposite of what empiricism, both of them being uh, epistemological concept in philosophy. So back to here, remember the themes I'm dealing with. You answer questions on Majid, you will answer questions on, excuse me, <laughs> on skepticism. You will answer questions on, we can ask you now, the rationalist thesis problem. So here we were looking at rationalism as a technical concept, like inflation in economics is not the same as the, the designer who is doing decoration in your house when he asks that you inflate the values. It's not talking the economic you know, term of inflation or if the critical thinker talks about present arguments, it's not talking about exchange of words. So liking to argue, when you say you like arguing, it could be negative, it could also be positive, depending on which connotation of the word argue you are using, okay? So rationalism or rationalists or to be rational may have diff the word rational could have different connotations. A sense in which even empiricists can be said to be rational in their approach to decision making. It doesn't mean they are rationalists in the technical sense of rationality. Okay, so that, that's gone. We cleared that off so that you don't get confused. Empiricists can be rational in the general sense of it. It doesn't mean he believes that the ultimate source, there we go, and foundation of our knowledge about reality is reason. That is what the rationalist in philosophy epistemology subscribes to. Okay, so we saw the various versions of a priori knowledge about reality that we have. The intuition deduction thesis, the innate knowledge thesis, and the innate concept thesis of rationalism. Ways of thinking of the person as a rationalist. We saw that reading. So we saw some themes around, around Plato's philosophy that makes him rationalist. On your screen now, keep looking, I'm projecting. Okay. Plato's rationalism that makes, uh, Plato's philosophy that makes him rationalist. And I don't think that I should bore you with that. I don't want us to run another lecture, it's not good for you. But I want you to be able to get the map clearly in your mind. So we moved from here and went to here and went to here. That's what I'm doing, okay? Plato's rationalism, so we saw his, his various theses in his philosophy that we can attribute rationalism to. Why? Because it had the feature of a priorities of some of those concepts, like metaphysical claims, like some mathematical claims, what have you, that he, Plato, for instance, claims. We have them, we know them prior to. So a prior, prior to experience. Not all knowledge in poor, those particular ones, he says we have them innately. We knew them. In, they were inborn, they were inscribed. So those ideas were inscribed. And we know how mm -hmm. someone like John Locke and his empiricist friends ah, reacted to that kind of knowledge. Okay, we know how uh, someone like John Locke and his empiricist, I've kept everyone muted, please keep it like that, okay? We are recording. Uh, reacted to that kind of knowledge, okay? Then we also saw Descartes' rationalism themes, or if you like, tenets of Descartes' philosophy that qualify him per the description of rationalism we've seen as being rationalist. Some of them include, and I don't want to add that now, if you still don't remember or you don't recall what makes Descartes rationalist, you just reference, you should refer your, to your notes. Look at the assignments you said you did, which I've made it at least. You can look at your text, reference, do all of those, and I think that you should you should do fine to fill in those gaps. Okay, then from Descartes, we saw the empiricist response. I've touched on that already. Then we launched into the problem of setting people apart, where we saw analytic, synthetic as the nature of the statements. We contrasted that with a priori, a posteriori, as how we grab that that the, the truth or falsity of that statement. Okay. And we say that Kant brings those in to help clarify 
how it is that a certain statement can be synthetic. It means it is not linguistic in nature. And yet that synthetic truth has a priori necessity and universality. Kant believes we can have such synthetic a priori truths, but he doesn't think that we get them the way that the rationalists we have studied so far would have thought. Or Plato would say we have such knowledge because they are already ingrained, inscribed in our minds prior to experience. Like we already know that God exists, for example, says Plato. And you can see a, a, a resemblance of that in a can or, or even African touch general. No one teaches the child who the supreme being is. No one teaches the child. It means it's not taught. Not through experience, not to the child already knows. That is the implication. A boyfriend will that. Not that the child comes to know through the senses. If he comes to know through the senses, then it will, the, the, he or she was taught. You see, oh, doc, maybe when he was lying there and then he touched the wall. And if he touched the wall to it, it means if you didn't put him near the wall, he wouldn't have known. So the Ubi in Chirakwadanyame has some intonation of rationalism of the kind that we attribute to Plato, the innateness. It is already known to the child. In other words, knowledge is recollection. Plato says so. And all the others we saw, don't let us waste too much time on that. Just review your notes if you want to get them fingertips for your exam. Okay. And so we said that he can't, won't argue for such synthetic right the way rationalists like Plato would do, or even uh, Descartes would do. Descartes says you intuit that knowledge. So it's still an idea that you do an intuition to get to know. Kant says no, it is not an idea in the head. Whether put there already initially, or you work your mind to get it to know. He says it is just the way the mind is framed. So he Kant introduces the apri categories of the understanding, which you know very well, <laughs> causality, substance, and some others. And even goes further to show us the apri conditions of experience, that space and time. They must be how the mind thinks. The mind's experience, so experiencing is done, or is created, or is formed, or is molded. These are in your, in your reference text that we give it a small flat and that you see how much work it did for us here that you had. So experience is not just the physical senses at work, but the mind contributes to it. So when I'm experiencing my mind actually, that is creating experience. But mind does that creation of experience because of how it is framed, how it is categorized. So that is how the mind sees. It's not something that is put in the mind. It's not an idea, whether innately or by intuition, that is put into a certain container. No, it's just how the container is framed. So if the container is square, 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 then whatever it produces will be square, square, square. And it is not something that has been, it's some square shape that has been put into the head, no. It's just how the mind, so the mind, as far as the world of the experience, what he calls the phenomenal world, is concerned. Every event must have a cause. The principle of causality is just how our mind is framed in the experiential world, or what he calls the phenomenal world. And so what? And so if we are dealing in the phenomenal world, experiential world, how, however we see will be based on the principle of causality. I say see, experience, will be based on how mind thinks. Mind thinks in terms of cause and effect. Mind thinks in terms of things, having an aligning substance and all the other 10 uh, uh, right categories that he can highlight to tell you that it's not something you put in there. What has he therefore done? He says, when you are going into the phenomenal, excuse me, the nominal world. In other words, when you want to know what really exists, who really caused it, what really did some that reality say? You are not talking the knowledge of it, you are talking the reality of it, says Kant. You are not talking the epistemology, you are not, you are not asking metaphysics. He says that one, we have to approach it from a transcendental idealist posture. 
Why? Because as far as if the knowledge is concerned, every knowing knowledge eh, begins with, a, with what? Experience. But it doesn't mean that it originates from experience. If you are knowing, if it is knowledge, eh, experience, experiential too, it will begin, the process of knowing will begin with experience. That makes the empiricist very happy until he completes his statement. But it doesn't mean the knowledge originates from experience. The origin is not just experience. Origin is means the source. I may be taking the plane from uh, Kotoka, International Airport Accra, to uh, where? JFK, where? Give me some place. It doesn't mean I come from Kotoka. So I may begin the knowing process with this experience doesn't mean the origin, the source of that knowledge is purely or a, 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 how do I capture that? You see the book is called The Critique of Pure Reason. It's not purely reason, it's not purely experience. So he has a critique of pure reason and a critique of practical reason. Just to show you that this idea of it is purely mind without any input of the senses is a joke. That's literally what it means. And vice versa, this idea of it is purely experience without any contribution of the mind. It's also a joke. That's why you may find it difficult to label Kant as a, either purely rationalist as defined or purely empiricist as defined. He's Kantian, and that marks a revolution mm -hmm. that uh, uh, marked the turning point in epistemology afterwards. So what have we said? Whether experience or uh, how do you say it? When I'm experiencing, don't think that it's just a sense at work. It is senses as inspired, if you like, by the thought framework contributed by mind. How the mind thinks is what makes the eyes see. So the mind is framed in a certain way. That things in terms of cause and effect. That's why when you see that water has poured, the first thing you, are, you ask is who did this or what caused it? Do you know why this can? Because that is how the human mind is framed to think in the experiential world. Now, if you got that, the question is, what then does Kant find wrong? Still on my screen, in the last part there, and then we are done. Kant responds to human skepticism. Hume, remember the starting point of that text. It is a closer look at Hume's skepticism that woke him up from his epistemological slumber. Hume had become the bossu at the time, the latest icon in terms of epistemology. <laughs> Everybody was talking, and what had what had his skeptic, uh, his philosophizing led to led to skepticism, the philosophical one about even the basic assumptions of epistemology. Everything had been rendered doubtful, and Kant said, "What? What has happened?" So his reaction mean, of course, to Locke, but Locke had already been ravaged, quoted unquote, by him. So when we read the text, you see that we dealt with his reaction to John Locke and then also to him, both of them empiricists, but one a substance dualist, the other one denying substance at all. That's him. So what does Kant say or find wrong with the two views that we came to meet? We dealt with it in class, remember. You you do not deny something because you don't have the ability to grab it through your channel of knowledge. That's what Hume did. Trying to find such a priori concepts or a priori categories of the understanding using the senses was not going to be easy. You can't do it. Uh, Kant says that one, Hume was right. Because the senses don't contribute to that. The senses don't give you causality. You can't see it. You assume it. You assume that it's the slap that made the guy angry. I remember all my funny examples in class. But the same slap, at other time, made him celebrate. Ooh, hit me again, babes. The same slap. So there, you don't, the cause and effect thing, causality is not what is observed. That's Hume's concern. Hume said, I don't see any necessary cause and effect relation if you like. Within one or the other, C, C, sensual. We just take it to be that it is the God who put a seed in the soil that it grew, something like that. Go we put seed sometimes, it doesn't go. Where's the necessity there for me to observe? 
And remember, Tan says the problem with Hume was because you can discover such necessity, remember a priorityness in synthetic claims, Hume then denied it. That's his problem. That's what led him to, him to skeptic. But if you can find the thing in your pocket because you are looking for it in your pocket, it doesn't mean it is not in the room or it doesn't exist. Maybe it is not in your pocket, it is in the drawer. So if you are using the senses to look for necessity and universality in synthetic claims, and you don't find it using the senses, you don't mistakenly therefore deny the thing's existence. That is Hume. I hope that that helps some of you. For John Locke, he claims he has used the senses to discover such a necessary truth like the principle of causality, like God is this what you Use the senses to find it, you say so. And yet, when you're applying it, you're able to apply something that is empirical to the non-sensed world. You see how I said it, not nonsense, but nonsense, the world that you don't sense empirically. To even to the point of deducing, if you like, arguing for the existence of God and in an immaterial, nonsense, you know, object of reality. How do you do that? That's magic. That is why he had plenty of problems. Otherwise, I would ask you, who caused God? Because you are applying the same principles that are detected in the empirical world beyond the empirical. If you are doing that, then you attract the questions that are supposed to be answered by the empirical frame. And then when you get there, you are found one here. You shouldn't ask who, call, who calls God. Do. Hey, if you do that, you go to why? Why shouldn't I ask? You took the causality principle outside of our little small minds of the experiential world. And you are taking it to beyond the physical. And so the questions will come. Those, this is level 300. And maybe if you do contemporary issues with us, I don't know if I'm still there. Taking that out, we will discuss the arguments for the existence of God and what have you. And some of the questions are, how can an omnipotent, omniscient, how can he be everywhere at once? That is difficult for you and I, our little minds. This is Kant. I'm not preaching. <laughs> but I can't, our little minds to grab that. Why? Because as far as the experiential world is concerned, if I told you that I was at the lecture hall teaching, I, the physical me, I'm not speaking figuratively, I'm not speaking by faith. I'm not speaking, uh, what's the other one, uh, uh, symbolically, but I said the physical me, I was standing at the lecture hall writing modus ponens, modus students, or whatever on the board for you people to copy or write or engage. We are, we're talking at the lecture hall. I can't at the same time, friends, the physical me can't at the same time be at the hospital mopping up the woman who delivered or holding the baby at the hospital. It can't happen. In where the experiential world as a challenge. In Kant, phenomenal world, experiential world. But in the nominal world, by faith, it can be everywhere at once. That's what Kant is telling you. So when you import the principles that operate in the physical world into the supposed world of what really happened, the reality, not the experience. But the reality, if you've forgotten, I keep telling you, you go back, back to Russell, level 200, reality versus appearance from Russell, not the, they're not Plato. Plato's own dealt with two worlds the world of the real versus the world of non physical, world of forms, uh, the allegory of the cave, and that's the Plato. I'm talking Russell's own, where he was dealing with the sensory world. Within the sensory world, there is the thing as it appears to me in the sensory world, and the thing as it really is in the sensory world, I'm not talking the world of forms now, but Russell, Russell tells us, I am doing the touching of the table, and I feel it to be smooth. You too, you can come and touch it and feel it to be rough. That is how I know it. I touch sensory world and sense. So I, when I touch it, I feel it to be smooth. You also know it, knowledge as an empirical knowledge. You also touch it, you feel it to be rough. Whose own is there? The reality of that table. 
the real nature of the texture of that thing. Whose own is that, that one? Why should it be mine and not yours? When we are all talking from our knowledge of the things supposed reality. It will be how I see that I'll present. What I have handled, that good scripture, right? What we have experienced, what we have handled, what we have seen, that is what we testify of. I'm speaking idealism now. That's what I can tell you. What do you want me to tell you? What do you have seen? Am I the one who did? I did the tasting of the pudding. It is inside my mouth. So what I know of it is what I can present. But, there comes the part. But if I know the thing to be something, knowledge, and I come and present it that the thing is like that, that is not knowledge. Now I'm talking the reality. I may know something of a thing that does not necessarily represent its reality. And so Russell prompts the idealist that, look, the way you see something, you're entitled to it as knowledge. But if you impose knowledge onto reality and say the God that answered by fire, so he is a fire brand, you will be disappointed another time when he shows you another reality of him where they are slapping him and he has turned the other half for them to slap on top. You are shocked. Won't this man do action? Well, you know the fire part of him. He might also be a dove, you see, or a lion of the tribe of Judah. And the next minute, he is a sheep that was led to the slaughter without saying anything. Easter, we went to kill him. Yes. So the way I know him should not be confused with the way he is because the, the two may, I didn't say the two are not the same. Russell said, be careful. The two may not be the same. May. Why? Because they may be the same. How I know it and how the thing is may be the same. Maybe they may not. So knowledge should not be imposed onto reality. We can work with it. So that's how we see the world for now. And I said all these things in class in different ways and forms. Okay. The geocentric view was what we thought we knew about the world, the earth in the center of the universe. That's knowledge. It changed. It has changed for thousands of years now. Now we hold on to the heliocentric view. We may change it again. The attitude of acknowledging that that's knowledge, that's the phenomena, not necessarily the nomina, is what Russell then advised. And I see it's the same line as the relevance of the discussion in Kant as well, that we shouldn't force our little minds. And I won't keep saying that. I won't stop saying that, sorry. The minds we have are little, we are creation. Don't, I don't care the titles we bear and what we think, the clout we think we have. It's just a slip of the nose. Hold the person's nose some, nose some few minutes and he's dead and gone. No matter the titles and the you know expertise and all the clout and whatever you they have, from red color to white color to green color, black color, uh, plenty money in the account or nothing. They eat gold and some people eat, it doesn't matter. I don't care the same thing. Hold the person's nose, this tiny little small holes. Hold it for some few seconds. Person is gone. Why you be trying? We are creation. So the way we want to impose the little we know about a, a world we didn't create. Look at how we are suffering to even see space. Space. Small space. We want to fly out of this a tiny little minute earth from God's creation. Look how we struggle. Aeroplane, the baby, you must say, who will win the engine before they think and even taking, taking of the noise. All of us together on it, creation, when we breathe and we snow together. Can you imagine the noise it will make? We yeah, are one tiny little bit. We have to be conscious of that. This is all lessons, or if you like, a spillage. When one judge visits somewhere, and that's like the whole world is for them. When one lecture, I'm a lecture, then we. Use myself, sit somewhere and think that he, he owns the whole world. He's ordering people, like, hey, if you don't sit down, Masa, a sniff. Tell anybody that if you have a friend sitting next to you, a sniff. You saw a friend like you your eyes somewhere. You don't even know where we will disappear to. You will lie there on the tender and will come. Those who want you bent will bend. Those who want you buried will bury you. You will know where you are. Or at least that's what we think. You have not died before. Listen. So the phenomena is what we can talk to talk about and speak to. Experiential wealth, that's all. 
And we need to do that because we have to survive in a world we didn't create. So we say that, oh, mosquito bites, if you get a, a fence, a tension it will kill it. Then we start working with it. If it doesn't work, the next day, then we have the humility of heart to adjust. Why? Because we don't know all of what really causes something. Not knowing it is a sign of what? Uh, uh, knowledge. You know that you don't know. Other than enforcing what you know of the world to represent what it is. So you are looking for it and you can't find it. And you think it must be that and therefore you deny reality. Then I see something positive now. Then we end. So I see the person in class seated there with, you know, oh, he's getting maybe some C's and B's and you think, you know, you, you have him covered. We now on Bob Yeah, this one, he will come to nothing. Really? Really, Wafa? Who told you that your philosophy, you know, it is the, the whole world? It is not. It's just how the world is now. So that's what we know for now. We manage. Maybe after school, you might not even do anything. Philosophy again. You may just shake someone's hand and your destiny will be changed overnight. The way we think of destiny. Yeah? Does it mean you shouldn't go to school? No, you must. Because that is what we know for now. Get a degree and get placement. But you may get a degree and you will not be placed. You will place people. Do we know that? So what? So cancers, and I end with that. Hmm. Don't make the mistake of saying that I'm looking for the principles, grounding, cause and effect. I don't see it through the senses. The senses don't offer me that. And that is true. And that is sincere. It's an empiricist. The senses don't tell me which brush God uses to bring brushes. How can I conceptualize a God that, it didn't, that, that wasn't created? My mind is struggling to come to terms with that. I don't, I can't observe a thing that wasn't created by another thing or didn't come from something else, causality. If it is there, you're able to trace what brought it about. Now you tell me that when it comes to God, yeah, you shouldn't ask that. That one, yeah, it's difficult to grab. Yes, that is where you get to. You should tell yourself that is difficult to grab, finished. You don't say, therefore, there is no God. That's how it goes. You grab you as to say there is no, there is no something. How do you know if you cry you are there <laughs> to deny another thing? And so he says, that is the problem. That's a uh, can't now. So the problem with Hume is he denies such principles as exist. He says there aren't any such uh, you know, uh, principle of causality. That's, in other words, it's not you can't say that for everything that happens must have been caused by something. He says why? Because he doesn't observe it, if you like, to the senses. He denies substance, the underlying thing for mental phenomena and physical phenomena. He, does, he denies that. Why? Because he cannot observe it to the senses. Not observing it to the senses is true. It's correct. The senses don't give us that. What we see are approximations and assumptions that we make. That is because I studied hard. That's why I passed. It's because I put the seed in the soil. That's why some seeds have been put in the soil and I will find nothing comes out. And Tiadua and Eja Mensa. So I'm going to go two, three times daily. No pregnancy. Every day of the week, morning, afternoon, evening, no conception. But we thought it is that that will bring conception. You see that? That's the point they're making. So there is no necessary, necessity is the issue connection between the supposed causal antecedent and causal effect. So the guy says, I don't detect that by observation or by the senses. Why do you claim that there is causality that I go, I get to know through the senses? This human says it isn't there. He's an empiricist. Why right? isn't there through the senses? They deny that it doesn't. You say, therefore, it is not there. There's no causality. Can't say that is the one that he got wrong. For luck, he Magically, I say magically because the thing is not given by senses. It's the truth is a synthetic one, so you expect it to be sourced empirically, but the senses don't give it. There's a certain necessity to it, yet the statement is a synthetic one. If it is analytic and it is necessary, we wouldn't have had any problem. It's just the language, backing dogs, back, backing chichis must must back. Whatever chichi is, we don't care. If it is a backing chichi, it must back. So that would have been purely what language. I'm sure that by now, if you had any confusions, they are settled. 
and you are remembering all the discussions we've had. I'm repeating most of the things I said in class in a way to tie in the discussion very well, okay, for especially the camps part. All right, so it is synthetic and yet it has a certain sense of necessity. Necessity means that's a by force be that principle, that knowledge follows all the time as universally and necessarily. So Kant says it is true. These claims shouldn't be thrown out. They are synthetic, yes, but they have a priori necessity. How do we know that? I say we don't have to know it as in going to take the knowledge and putting it into the mind. No, it's just how the mind is structured. That's why you just can't help it but to ask, who beat him? What is making her cry? Why is she crying? Why is she failing her exam? Why? How is it that she's always passing her exam? That's also the course you are looking for. What, what about this woman makes her lecture like that? You're looking for course. Why are you looking for course? Kant says because your mind is framed that way. In this experiential world, that is how the mind is framed to think in terms of substance, in terms of cause and effect. And experiencing itself is based on what the conditions, a priori conditions of the understanding, which is contributed by who? By the internet, the mind, the understanding again. Yet, anytime you know knowledge, it begins, the process of knowing begins with experience, five senses. But remember, experience is not purely the senses at work. So the knowledge doesn't originate. It's not sourced only from experience, even though it begins with experience. And so if you remember my switch example, the light that you see in your room didn't come from your switch. It is the switch that you press, correct? Then you saw the light. That is what started the pro process of getting the light to. Okay? If you enter the room and the room is dark, you tell the, the oh, so light, you know, switch it on. But the origin, the root of that light, maybe it's a kosumbo or wija or dinsu. I don't know where some of you get yours from. Okay, the origin, where the thing is, then the power will come. The switch is only the thing that ignites it, starts the process. But the source is bigger than that thing and the world. There. And so experience begins the process of knowing, but it is not the origin. Says Kant, and I think that, that so remember that when you are approaching the non the, the, the world of the nominal, you can use Kant's language so that you are seeing, yeah. yes, or the world of reality. Then he says, What approach it as a transcendental idealist when you are transcending the spiritual yeah. world, when you are transcending the hey, who is giving me commentary at the background? Day? Are you watching Ghana football or something? <laughs> When you are transcending the real, the, the phenomenal world, be an idealist. What does idealist mean? What, does it mean? what I know of it is what I present. I don't, I don't assume that what is there is what I know. They are not the same. And so I won't go asking who is the father of God in the nominal, because the concept of God is not given to us in experience the way we see a table and a chair and ask who put the table here, then we will go yeah, yeah, the fact I'm free, I come and take the table or the chair from here, because you know it was yeah, yeah, that cause it. Or who is the father of so-and-so person? We can trace her and go and find the father. That one works in the physical or experiential or phenomenal world. Okay. But in this world, whatever has happened must have a cause. That is how the mind works, says uh, If you go and ask the same question about the nominal, you have problems. That is when you ask, when will God shave his beard? How can he be everywhere at the same time? You can't put him in space and time, restricted. Human beings in the special world are restricted by space and time. Or two. You can't ask the same thing. Of God. God can be here. I mean, now you're yes, speaking faith, OK? God is here helping you write your exam that you are struggling with. The next minute, not even the next, at the same time, he's in the aeroplane that is trying to fall, and someone has called his name. He's there, saving the person. At that same time, someone has eaten extra big blow of uh, order. 
and the heat is melting his throat. And he said, what did you mean? And he said, at the same time, how do you use your little restricted mind? Your mind is limited to space and time. Contingencies. How is he able to grab this? So if the prophet tells you, a true prophet of God, for example, I believe in prophecy. I don't want you to believe in it. I can't impose it on you. But just, just to give you some example, if the prophet told you that right now I'm in the classroom, right? I've entered into your hall and I see that someone is trying to break into your door. He has opened it. Those who see some of them, they are genuine. If there's a counterfeit, they are genuine, sincere. Yeah? Not all of them are counterfeit, but there can be genuine one. And he tells you that I see that and I see this. So when you go to your room today and you open your lock, open it two times. And when you open, close it this and do this and do that. You, if you're not careful, you will think that this one, the azar, if it is azar, that's negative. Then there is a positive that is being what uh, corrupted. Like, like Descartes argument. If there's an imperfect, it makes sense to talk imperfect only if there's perfect. If there's no perfect, what is the name? What's the meaning of imperfect? Imperfect is negation of perfect. So you can't understand imperfect if you haven't conceptualized perfect. If there are negative, so-called, uh, I can see into the future, or a fake uh, doctor, for example, then it means there's original doctor, that someone is faking it, okay? And the fake tries to look like the original. So there will be things that someone can tell you, if you are not careful and all you know is media seeing is believing, you, how do you even see? Seeing what? The person could tell you things, and because you're lim like, limited, how can he be here and say he's at home? How can he say he's here? He has gone to three years back and has gone to the uh, NFA. Has, uh, if it is has uh, listen, then there's the original. And people may be talking, and I'm not saying go and be gullible, right? Think that, but don't also be arrogant about things you don't know. And claim that because you don't have the capacity to know it, then it means it is not there or it is not real. Well, it's not even good or bad that it's not real. It's not for you to determine whether it's real. Or, or if you don't think that you, you are able to accept it, walk away. But don't deny it. Or don't also impose it and say it must be there. It might not be. Maybe someone's eating and you are satisfied and is talking plenty. Or someone wants to dupe you. All those are possibilities. But they are about the reality. So be an idealist when it comes to what? transcendent matters. And on that note, and we'll buy an elaboration on our last topic day. Oh, that thing disappeared. <laughs> it's a side of waiting. We were done. Let me just make sure. I've shown you everything on that course. We are done with our course, and I'm ready to check any questions you may have. Children, I'm on online. Please. Uh, so this is our, please, sorry, let me reproject. The course outline whilst I take your questions if you have any please. So at your resource too, you will see this. And we were at the last one, which was Kant's response to human skepticism. And we have done our discussion. The end. Any questions, please? Let me go to my slide and see if there is a hand up. Any questions, please? I'm glad we did our, our session online today. I don't think we have a good weather. But people can be at the same place. Okay, still engage. I'm showing you your assignment too now. But do you have questions, please? I just moved off. Okay, I don't see a hand up. If it's a question, the person should feel free and raise their hand. I'm going to the other slide, the other screen now. So I opened the assignment for a makeup. If you look at the left here, yeah, I'm here now. We have highlighted here yeah, to show you. Look, look at it from here. So I opened the makeup for those who couldn't do the original assignment so that you don't lose the mark. And if after that you still didn't do it, I'm sorry, I won't be able to help you again. The individual assignment too, I reopened it. So you can have records on Sakai and the Descartes one. The rest are in class and I have them there. And I plan to release everything when I'm done. Exam. Format. Initially, if you look at my those who are looking at past questions, you would see that I would have asked, uh, let me see, I would have asked a compulsory question, and then you would 
the word. Uh, let me see. Okay, so I have the 307. I want to see, show you a sample, the most recent one. Oh, no, not I. I want an example. 307. Yeah, okay, so I have one here. The, it's the eyes. Let me give you the. What is public group? I would normally have given you an exam question. Mm -hmm. This is fine. So let me show you this. Then we can, you can have a feel of the most recent way of certain exams. And then they're out of here. But I don't plan to do a compulsory question this time around. Because we are working for 70 and we want to be as liberal as we can to help everyone. However, it will be difficult to punch. Those who like to punch, when I say punch, they choose one and then they choose some topics and study for it. I won't advise that you do that. It might not go well for you. Just make sure you have covered grounds. So one of you may read for me. This is last year's questions I sent that I sent. This is for both main and city campuses. They had two hours. It's likely you may have two and a half hours because it is for 70 marks now. And we don't want you claiming that you would have needed some extra time to read. If you even spend 30 minutes on each question, that will be one and a half. You may have used the first 30 minutes to think through the questions and make sure you have understood the demands of the question, all the aspects of it. You have created some ideas, illustrations to beef up your argument, make it nice. You have your essays organized on paper nicely before you set, you set off. So you need maybe 10, 15 minutes per question to do that thinking around. And then the 30 minutes to do the write up introduction, bodies, so paragraph one, maybe paragraph two, paragraph three, all interspersed with examples, illustrations to address your point, and then maybe conclusion for each of each one of them. So plus or minus some 10 minutes for each of the 30 that you are doing can take you into two hours and say some five or 10 minutes. Then you read over, make sure you have written, look, your ID and your signature are requirement. I hope that I don't have to be looking for people's ID because some people write IDs and they leave two or three of them out. What do you want to ask? You open into the answer booklet, it's not there. When you open your answer booklet at the top there, you have to write your IDs there. Because sometimes the one you wrote at the back is either bled or you forgot because of pressure. Sometimes you, you write five out of six of the numbers. But when we go into the answer booklet, then we are able to reconcile it with the other one. Sign your signature, authenticate what is there. All the details behind that, uh, in front of the answer booklet, put it there, make sure the back of your answer booklet is stamped. Of course, that one day, the center authorities ensure that. Okay. So you are likely going to have two and a half hours for three questions, likely two sessions of the questions, three at the top, two at the down. The three will, will be 25 marks each and you choose two from there to be 50 marks. Then the next session, there will be two from there, you choose one, It'll be 20 marks. So 50 plus 20, 70, beautifully done. Udoji enye yi. Unye enudoji. That means you cannot dodge five topics or five main questions but because of the level of difficulty one will be wet the, the first session will have michael come and see who is there apologies sir. please i'm multitasking there's someone at the gate okay so so the first session will have three questions then you pick any two each worth 25 marks so the two will be 50 marks for the first session there will be only one question left today then the second session, you will have two questions and you pick one, which will be worth 20 minutes and add to the top there. I hope that those are clear. So one of you may want to read this one just so you have a few and then I will end the session. If you have a question, just raise your hand. Okay, I see a hand up now. So let me take that. Abigail, I can. Abby, please go ahead with your question. Or you want to read for me as well? Um, or, yes, yeah, please. I want to read. You. Oh, thank you, my lady. Go ahead. Then. So the question is on your screen. 
In according, in accounting for how synthetic a prior line knowledge is possible, Immanuel Kant maintains that knowledge starts with experience, but it does not originate from experience. How does Kant explain this statement? Critically assess the implications of this claim for knowledge of concepts such as God that fall beyond his phenomenal world. Your assessment should be give should give you attention to Kant's prescription of transcendental idealism in dealing with concepts of his nominal world. <clears throat> this one, by the time you finish reading, you cannot bear 10 or 15 minutes. So. <laughs> but it's not difficult at all. It's just demand. You have to write so much and you have to have attended lectures and engaged content. So if you had, then it was a compulsory question. Meaning that you can't swear it. You can't save that rationalism and then you bypass it and do some quick quick. Some people do that. And that guy, they won't do it with one minor in here. Then when they got it, they come, oh, please, I won't recommend this. How do I recommend it? Department, they will do it here and you go and take one here, then you pass it, you swear one quarter. When people are taking six and they are carrying on their shoulder and they come out with that fine class they have there, first class or something. Then you bypass, uh, you go and do small one beer, you swerve one, one call, then you jump, jump your little Later on, you come to that same department, you're looking for recommendation. How do we recommend you that you are competent in the courses that we teach them? When one dodgy BPR, you have dodged everything. <laughs> this one is not dodgeable. So, Madam says, in accounting, Abigail says so, eh? in accounting for how, look at the emphasis, how is italicized? For those who may want to see, see the how is in italics slanted. For emphasis, I'm trying to show you that that is the emphasis. If you read, you saw it in the text as well. In accounting for how such synthetic a priori knowledge is possible, Immanuel Kant did something. How did he account for synthetic a priori? Kant maintained that, and we quote him there, knowledge starts, begins eh, with experience. It doesn't originate from experience, unquote. We have quoted it. That is what he maintains. That that is how it is that he can make a case for synthetic a priori knowledge. He tells you that synthetic a priori knowledge is possible, and in doing so, he makes this case. He remains, he maintains that he stands by this statement that knowledge begins with experience. It doesn't originate from experience. That's information. There's no question yet. Now, my question to the student then is: How does Kant explain this statement? Very easy. What is the explanation Kant offers for the claim he has made? This claim he has made in order to substantiate his position that there are synthetic prior knowledge, but he explains it differently from the way rationalists does so. So how does he explain this thing? Kant says, if you know at all knowledge, then it has to begin, that process must begin with experience. You can use illustrations to make the point, like plenty, the plenty examples I gave. So knowledge is not the same as what? Reality. Or in Kant's terms, the phenomena is not the same as the noumena. Why? The phenomena is within the experiential world. That is why for you to know at all, it has to begin with experience. In Kant's terms, that looks fine for who? The empiricists. They will say, you see, who you are? Knowledge bad yet. Which will come to us through experience until cancer and hold on. But the experiencing itself is not purely senses. That's what his critique of practical reason is meant to do. Don't think that when we say you are experiencing, it's just your five senses at work. It says cut. So that's the second part. But it does not originate from experience. He says to experience at all means you are already employing. A categorization. If you don't want to say employing, that's employing is Nancy's language. Nancy is a senior lecturer now, and it is so soon to be a support. <laughs> in Tanya, if you can say employ, you to use your way. You can say in experiencing, can says you use. Hmm? You use a priori concept. The mind is framed, the mind is categorized. The mind is structured in a certain way. The mind is uh, presents itself in a certain way. All these are various ways of saying the same thing. You don't have to use Nancy's language to sound all important. 
Because if my professor is too hard on me, I don't sound important. And it's okay. Be ending in learning. So far as you are communicating the substance, that's what matters. The style may not be the same. Okay, so I'm saying that cancers, the knowledge does not originate from experience. Means, he says, so you have to explain. What is he saying with all this plenty big big? He says, oh, no, no, don't worry. If I will know anything at all, it has to start with the senses. What empiricists have called what experience. But Kant goes further to explain to the empiricists or anyone who believes that knowledge is experience, that look, what you are calling the experience is not just the senses at work, because your senses work on the basis of what? A priori categories of the understanding, like the principle of causality, like the principle of substance, like the principle of existence. The thing has to exist to be seen at all. Kant therefore tells us that the origin of that experiencing is not what? Purely senses. Pure means there's no adulteration. It's not just the senses. There's a mix. The mind, understanding, if you use Kant's language, the intellect, if you use Plato, these are all referring to the thing, is hinged upon a certain framework, Ujina, framework so for the senses to see. So you can't see without the senses. Uh, the mind. The C is the eye, but the eye is depending on the mind's framework to see. And therefore, if I claim I'm experiencing, I'm already assuming that the thing exists in space and time. But those are what a prior, uh, a prior concept of what? Experience. Conditions of experience, thank you. A prior conditions of experience, conditions that must prevail before you can even experience that. The thing must be in space and in time. So what? So a concept like God, there goes the second part of the question. After you do this explanation of what he means by, you begin to know with experience, but experience is not the origin of knowledge. See, the second part says, critically assess the implications Implications mean what this means, the consequences of this claim he has just made for knowledge of concepts such as God. It means, therefore, there's a positive and a negative, depending on how you see it. May I like it when people can't understand the concept of God? Why? Why do you want to understand the concept of God? The day you finish understanding everything about God, he's no longer God. He's, his, his, how do I say it? The reason why he's God is in the fact that we to maintain us in here. All I said is, look, the day you finish understanding such a concept like God, which is central to religion, eh, do you finish understanding everything about God, the way you want to understand your pen? Even your pen you are writing, to you as you your nail, you haven't finished understanding it. You want to know everything and grab this, this big, hmm? Overwhelming, unfathomable, inexplainable concept of God. You want to finish. Anytime human reasoning wants to finish grabbing that, there's, there's confusion. Then there's absurdity and, excuse my language, stupidity. Says so Kant. Amanda Wong said it. We read it together in class. You start talking gibberish and nonsense. Why? Says can't. I said we saw it in class <laughs> in the text. It was in what it did. You start talking nonsense and I said it. Because you can't put that concept, there we go, in the frame of the experiential, where there's the limit of what? Space and time. So if you, the person is here, it can be over there. It can be over there at the same time. So how can you say, oh, Nyamebe Chre? Is God in the future already? Yes, he's there. And at the same time, the past, mm -hmm. In the present, mm, is ever present. As we conceive of him, in faith, he's in the past, he's in the present, he's in the future, all at once, not once in a while, not very fast from the past into the, no, it's at once. Why he, mm, that's what we do. But maybe he could also be she, doesn't hurt anybody. If it is for us and you alone go and speak for us, why, why? And I don't speak for Ghana, I read that. So, so we can drag it on and on unless we are forcing the thing to fit our categorization. There comes the second part. And so I'm saying that there's a positive and a negative. When we go, the implication of what Kant is saying is 
those who want to force God to be experientially accessible to people who create problems. God that is everywhere at once was sitting on a chair. See how you get confused? It's a representation of him, which is fine. He's still God. But if not, people will struggle to grab that. God was nailed on the cross. Yes, an office of him. Don't you know that your lecture talking to you now is also a mother? Yes, and a daughter. And a sister. Oh, yes, a mentor and a mentee. What kind of confusion is that? Mm. Even in the physical world, it's possible. So she can be arrested by the Holy Spirit and a free person in class. A prisoner and a free person all at once. If we struggle to conceptualize, it is because we are forcing the such an I, uh, the concept. I, as I keep saying concept, concept. When you come to faith, if I'm talking my faith with you, or we are faith people talking, we don't think of God as a concept. Too. What is a being? Just a being that we are, we are struggling to get the whole part of him. And it is okay if we struggle to get his totality. How can I explain a God that is inexplainable? How do you explain which language are you going to use to explain? Your language, you know, who created it for you? Who can use your language to grab it? So that's the challenge. So the implication is for us to know knowledge, it means it will have to begin with experience. And so someone may start asking, then what brush did God use to brush his teeth? Like I said in the, when I was giving the mop up, now we are addressing the specific question. Someone will ask if he is, a, he is the creator of the whole world that has existed in, in, in eternity. I said it in class, then by now his beard will be subtle and gray, and you know, will be an old man holding it. Who has drawn any version of any god deity at all that is, you know, hot and dripping with his sneakers and, you know, Swag or the who draws that kind of God, even with with our deities that people call God, uh, uh, what Zeus and whatever, how do they draw them? Always an old man. It's an imposition of what we are thinking that if he created everybody, look at my grandfather was created by God or was regulated by my grandfather grew gray as he grew. You think of it that way, it's the frame of the mind. So the implication is as soon as we can't put something in the frame of the experience, it might look inaccessible, not knowable. See that we would have to use another means to grab that concept or talk about that. It's not just God, free will, life after death, uh, some of the moral claims. You look at your face and they say you can marry a dog. And you see society and all this. It, and I mean, we all think it's right. You and who think so? Plato is telling you that. And then he passes away a crime. You wake up and they say, hello, babes. And you say, whoa, 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 whoa. And you think it's fine? You say, oh, but that is, society says it's fine. But you says it's not society that told you that. What society is telling you, you already know it's not right or it's right, depending on how you see it. So he's appealing to your nativeness. Can't you say no? Such things are already how I'm just giving an example for the moral. So when you read Kant on moral philosophy, then he shows you another channel to use. We are interested in its epistemology, not for its ethics. But look at it now. It has implication on concepts such as God, and I've just shown you that. The concept of God then is taken out of the frame of experience. It becomes a faith matter or a nominal matter. Is it positive? I think so. Some other people of faith may think, no, no, where you do that then people can't relate to God. He can't relate to God, say. Didn't he know he can't relate to him? That's why he brought his son. He's everywhere at once. How does that make sense? <laughs> it doesn't make sense. He created the heavens and the earth. Where was he before he created the earth? It will be confusing. So he gave us someone that we can relate to. Now I'm talking faith. So not all will share. He gave us a being that has flesh like you and I. That we can see the mother. This is the mother. And we can even pretend to know the father. Huh? Mm -hmm. And so he will eat and dance. They will send him to go and buy something. If he doesn't go, the mother will beat the bottle. So we can now, through that, be able to relate with the unseen father. Maybe that helps someone. 
but that is a matter of faith, just to put some flesh to it. Now, for Kant, back to Kant, the implications of this claim for knowledge of concepts such as God that fall beyond his phenomena, I've showed you, these ones will now then not be accessible to us in terms of knowledge. If it is knowledge, we should be able to objectively agree or disagree on in the phenomena world. It will be a matter of dogma, if you like, or how people see transcendent idealism. If they see the way I see, then we share faith. We all become Islam, or we all become Christian, Islamic, sorry, or Christian, or Hare Krishna, or what does faith matter? If it's political party, then we all become NDC, uh, Social Democrat, or MPP, Party Women Democracy. Or if it is a matter of culture, then we think that it's okay for women to shut up, men should talk, because we see the same way, we know it that way. If we don't, then we, we part with sort of phenomena. Your assessment should give due attention to Kant's prescription of transcendental idealism. I've answered that in dealing with Kant's concept of his nominal world definition. The concept of God was one of them to show why he says so when it comes to such matters, which we, we don't have, you know, uh, spiritual knowledge of collectively shared, then we, we should be what? Transcendental idealists. Very easy question. Not easy. And uh, you have to say a lot around. You should have read well, explain the starts with experience, doesn't originate from experience, show its implications, which is so concepts like God did. It is not given to us an experience. We have to approach it as a concept. So God will keep revealing himself differently for those who believe it. Be all the time, because it's the reality. How you know him, you don't impose it. Otherwise, you'll be like Jonah. I told you, go and forgive the people now. Jonah said, hey, who go? Say, you have to punish them. But you say you punish them. But I've changed my mind. Why? Is it by force? He said, no, I won't do this. You have to punish them. Peter, rise, kill and eat. He said, I won't kill them. These are all clean. Hey, I told you they are unclean. Now I say they are clean. Say unclean. The marking skin is in my eyes. I'm the instructor. I'm the creator. You are the creation. So if I told you I'm marking the, the cutoff point is 15 to 20, they will all get uh, 20 over 20. That's how I, I, I create it. Or University of Ghana says, for example, that 0 to 44, eh? 0 to 44 is an F. You say, no, no, no. Why should zero to 44? I, I invest your Ghana. Then go and create your own invest. You have a grading scheme. Because invest your Ghana has its grade. First, it wasn't so. First, F was zero to 30 or something. When I was a student, A was 30, uh, 70, sorry, 70 to 100. But before you get the 70, Allah, now I bless. What bless? You bless her ah, before you get 70. Now, is it the same? No. Now, A is 80. And there was no. Uh, the, in my in my time, there was A minus. So from A, you get to A minus before B plus. Now, the current grading scale doesn't have A minus. Will you say, no, 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 you have to go back to what was being done at the time? Why? Is it your investigation? <laughs> so the person may reveal himself, God now, hmm, to people differently at different times, even the same fit. It may be if you don't have that question of a transcendental idea, you will you will impose your knowledge of God onto God that you have to answer by fire. This thing that my in-law is doing to me, you must answer by fire. And he's not answering by fire. I'm robber in the church, God is drinking so good. Hey. Mm -hmm. Because if he wants to do something, he will do it. You are the clay, he's the porter. So have the that attitude and let him reveal himself to you that today I'm a kind. Loving father who will give away even my son for the world party. The next day, if I want to raise the rod and came, shut up. Something like that. It's not arbitrary, it's just the person's office that you must acknowledge. Something like that. If that helps some of you, then I use that example as well to show you uh, what to show you transcendental idealism. So you have that posture then. You approach concepts like God. Don't impose your knowledge of it onto the reality. As for the knowledge, it will begin with your experience of it. So the one who experienced God is a thing. You can't change their mind. Sure. People who have had a certain experience with Johnny Bravo, how Johnny treated them in that relationship. And so no, no, but Johnny has changed. They say, hey, the man is apologies. If you have a psychologically sick person, okay, 
I'm just making examples, things I can relate to is a good, a good number of you can relate to, to help you understand. They say, a mad person, even if you cure the mad, the small one that they will use to scare children, they will still be there. Experience, that's what experience does. Be careful what you make people experience about you. Sometimes, even when you change it, they have that. So they know what they know begins with experience. That's why it's difficult. Some people you can see that where they are sitting, they are being deceived by the so-called, uh, you know, look where. But they are still there. Oh, blah, blah, blah. You drag and drag, they are still sitting there because of an experience they had. Okay, so no way always begin with experience, but it doesn't mean that that knowledge originated from experience. I've used some few things to help. Then the second half, and these ones are easy, so I'll just touch on them. And then choose one question only. So it means I give them 35. 35 one was the compulsory question. And then any one that's for 15 marks to make 50, because the total was for 50. Okay. Must irrationally subscribe to the superiority of reason and or the indispensability of reason thesis of rationalism. Justify your answer. You know what the answer is. This is a straightforward. It's not your plenty that you write that says anything. Answer this question. If I am a rationalist, what is required is for me to subscribe to at least one of the following intuition, deduction thesis, innate knowledge thesis, or innate concept thesis. At least one. If I subscribe to all, all the better. But I don't need all, I need just one of them. But for the superiority of reason thesis, or if you like, also the indispensability of reason thesis, they are not a requirement. They are an embellishment. Just like, and I give you examples in class, just like the vegetables that they splash or they sprinkle, depending on which version of it they have, on your jollof rice. You go and buy jollof and chicken. And they give you ketchup on it. Ketchup no, is an addition. Without it, if they give you the jollof and the chicken, they still give you jollof and chicken. So the essentials are the other ones. Superiority of reason makes a judgment of reason over and above the other one. But I could be a rationalist and not necessarily claim that reason is superior. Okay? I may give reason precedence. Um, I, I can serve reason first. It doesn't, oh, who is this? It doesn't mean reason is superior. And I use a class session to tell you. Sometimes I may give precedence to lecture time. 5.30 to 7.30 if I have a class like that. Over and above church time. Maybe church is around the same time, 6 to something. But I have a lecture. Giving precedence first, treating it first, doesn't mean lecture is superior to my spiritual whatever. It's a joke. Who told you? Okay, so precedence doesn't necessarily mean superiority. And so uh, uh, those who argue for superiority of reason that is not a requirement for qualifying you to be a rationalist. Okay. And then the indispensability one says, reason is indispensable. You can't do away with reason when it comes to knowing. No, not necessarily. Why? Because some of the, I can be rationalists only when it comes to certain, who is a rationalist, that at least some knowledge about reality is gotten a priority without the help of a community. So, she that. Doesn't mean that I can't do away with reason. I may be able to. Okay. So there are several, or I may need the two together. That is why these two are not necessarily a requirement for being a rationalist. If you think otherwise, you may argue to show that. And that is why it's philosophy. But justify your answer. Then Trace says critically assess Locke's critique of Plato's view of the theory of unity. That one day. Look at the question very well. People sometimes deviate. I can twist this question several times. I may ask the same thing again, but twist it in a way to check your understanding. Locke's critique of Plato. So Locke is criticizing Plato, and you are supposed to critically assess Locke's critique. So what is Locke's critique? Locke doesn't think there was anything put in the mind before but In other words, he thinks the mind was what a tabula rasa. Plato thinks, no, oh, there were at least some knowledge already ingrained in the mind, implanted, they inscribed. That's why he believes in innateness. That's Plato. Locke disagrees with Plato for the reasons given. I gave you the reference. We discussed it. We did assessment in, in class.
distance marathons on it over and over again. If you are not too vexed in it, play back some of the recordings or review the text. As for taking me back into the lecture hall to go and do it again, it's difficult. <laughs> in other words, to rewind and play. Then we, are, we live in space and time. This is a phenomenal world. You can rewind me to stand. I, I can rewind the recording. So, so do that and fill in those gaps. Knock make some arguments, and we are asking you to react to knock. You should be able to do that. And in other words, defend Plato's auto on his theories. And then the last one, critically examine the rationalist tenets of Descartes' epistemology. Critically examine the tenets, the 